Gotcha, bro. Gotcha. Knowledge, encyclopedia and knowledge of superheroes. I can speak, I swear, and Andrea will come up correctly if I don't. Uh, James Tucker. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Uh, Matt Bomer, our own <laughs> Super differences and challenges, and, and how did you uh, approach this one? Well, actually, interestingly, I wrote this one first. Really? Like this? Yeah. Um, this was the first uh, animated movie that I wrote for them. I've been working with them for uh, years and years, and now going on 18 years that I've been uh, writing for the, uh, the DC Animated Crowd, and, and a project with Andrea, and Burnett, and Lavini, and Bruce Tim, and James. Um, the differences uh, between this and, and The Dark Knight Returns, uh, obviously they're both adaptations. Um, the funny thing, one difference is Dark Knight Returns is such dense material, so, you know, so much story in there, that we had two whole movies and we started to cut things out. Um, this one, it's, it's a really great short story in the comics, and the real challenge was make it longer. That was kind of Alan's first instruction to me was, you know, make more story. Um, so I, I kind of thought of this as uh, Jeff Johns paved a really great solid highway and adapted this gave the opportunity to kind of find some roads and some, you know, parks that along the way. And those were the subplots, the stuff with Clark and Lois, um, uh, the stuff going on in Supergirl in the story. Um, uh, really look for themes that play with, you know, um, what's going on in Brainiac's character and psychology, and also relates to what's going on in Superman, and Superman's regular behavior to control his relationship with games. Um, and so he learns exactly what uh, Brainiac's is. So that was the kind of stuff that, you know, was expanding in this one, rather than figuring out how to fit it in. Mr. Tucker, um, we'll get this one out of the way right after that. Um, in case you haven't been on the internet today, uh, and the odds of that, Chris uh, Kim is taking a, a short leave from the DCU films. Um, uh, you know, we don't we don't make these overnight. Uh, like I'm pointing myself, we don't make them overnight. That's good. We don't make these overnight. And uh, we started this about a year and a half ago. Uh, Bruce was already starting to work on Green Lantern, the animated series. He was involved in the Flaming Sea. Uh, <laughs> like that. Oh, right over there. Uh, uh, 
and he is developing some original material that you guys are going to jones for. I'm telling you, it's something else. So, um, Mr. Tucker will be, uh, has inherited the, 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 the reins and is steering in quite the way. So you want to give me an idea of what, what the new approach is to the DC Universe, to animated original movies? Well, me personally, anyone who knows my work from Breaking the Ball knows I love the DC Universe. And so um, I just want to bring more of that to what we're doing with the DCU, with the, with the movies, bring more of the, the whole world of DC. <laughs> those characters. So it's just not Superman, Justice League, Batman, but it's a whole array of the DC universe. So that's my goal uh, going forward. But, uh, you know, that's what we've always tried to do as a group, and I think that's what I'm going to continue to do. I'm trying not to do every single one. And Jim, congratulations, man. Oh, <laughs> can't tell you everything that's coming. If you come to Comic-Con, we'll tell you everything that's coming for 2014. But, uh, When's uh, Comic-Con? You want to, what? When's Comic-Con? <laughs> Comic-Con's in the summer. It's the middle of July. It's a beautiful time in San Diego. You're going to love it. I'd, I'd call him out and get a hotel reservation. <laughs> Too late. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, Andrea and James have been working feverishly on the entire 2014 slate, and we do have three films coming then, and I promise you, you guys will love it. So, and have I ever lied to you? No. Uh, I'm one of you guys. It's the fun. Speaking of one of you guys. Uh, one of the fun parts of working with talent that we have is, uh, is when they get excited about a project. Um, I once said Thundercats out loud and somebody on this panel's eyes burst. Uh, you got me you know, you know, Clark Kent have glasses over there? <laughs> this was a role you really wanted, though. I mean, you've got uh, a little Superman experience anyway, right? Correct. Yeah. I, um, you know, I think it's such an iconic part for... Anybody who grew up loving superheroes, or any human being, really. So the chance to get to, to play it in any medium was just a dream come true. And thankfully, I had these two to guide me uh, in newer waters. And uh, it was just a blast. It was, it was a dream come true. He was really good, wasn't he? <laughs> Sit down, Mike, please. <laughs> And so when I screen them here with you guys, for me it's like watching a new movie. It's just like I've never seen it. And when you when the character first opened his mouth and your voice came out, I thought, perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> and of all the superhero voices that we record, the most difficult is Superman because I counted no less than eight times we elected King Shoot. <laughs> We did yeah. the ADR session, you came in and recorded like about three hours of ADR. Yes. Then we did it and leave and go do something. Then he came yeah. back and screamed for like another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> he said it to the end. <laughs> so he still have a voice left. And I that. gave Andre and James a few good laughs because I got really into it physically. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Superman was punching, I would punch however he did. When I got hit, I was like hitting myself. I was knocking the mics over. And I looked in the sound booth and made all some laugh at really good at catching uh, hits we miss. Right. Oh, so, wait a minute, Superman hit that guy. All right. Well, You're right. You go back and get it. I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. <laughs> just, just to joke on with Andrea, I mean, you brought so many different layers to the character. You know, the, uh, obviously everything's got sort of like kind of strong guy who knows everything the right thing to do. But this, you know, this particular version of Superman needs so much humanity and his relationship side and his vulnerability and you know, not knowing what to do with Lois and and just just every piece of it. That, just as Andrea said, I mean, the minute you start talking, it's that Superman. Um, and you know, we, myself included, have a lot of other Supermans in our heads that we're, we're hearing. And, and a second in, you don't hear that anymore. Everything about it, just, just Thank you very much. Miss Molly, 
Uh, you are a teenager. Um, you are a teenager. There are a lot of teenagers in the room. There are a lot of pre teens in the room, apparently. Uh, could you fully relate to Supergirl and her emotions? Was that an easy uh, turn for you? I have to say that was very easy. But she tends to be uh, more right than I am. Which, it, it was just so much fun to play a teenager group like this a lot. And the kids were defeats and warlords and things like that. All those things that I always wanted to do and still would like to imagine that I could. I just didn't think about it constantly. Uh, so I could completely relate to her and just how headstrong she was. But it's really the ultimate sense of right and wrong that I connected it's with just, it's and that I really love. <laughs> it's a winner. <laughs> Andrea, these weren't the only two actors in the film. We had uh, a fellow named John Noble. And then <laughs> what, uh, um, I, I remember John um, doing a lot of uh, closing his eyes and putting himself into the moment. What, what, uh, what were the keys? And I know you guys were close. So. He was. I loved working with him, so incredibly elegant and, and wonderful, and you know, we spoke a little bit about how we have previously portrayed Berniak in a somewhat robotic way, and we opted completely not to do that. And James made a decision that I thought was so wise, which is when we first go into the Berniak ship, the ship speaks. And he decided that John Noble should do the voice of the ship. And I don't know if you guys recognize that. It's not the first time this one. You just know it. Yeah. 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 So we you buy the DVD on May 7th. <laughs> uh, this is right. You'll notice that you treated the voice a little bit differently. Like, didn't you change it? You did something, pitched it down, and electronically fussed with it. But it was such a great idea because then later in the script, he actually says, I am the ship. And then, okay, well, that makes sense. That bring that board. That, the ship would speak in very next voice. But what John did was so interesting in that he he tried to bring some humanity to this character, and it's not what you would think of as a character with much humanity. But he did, and it's it, it's remarkable to perform as I think it's it's rich and deep and full and certainly not one note which Brainiac can tend to get. And it was just one of those truly beautiful recording experiences and we were very lucky. This entire cast assembling it was remarkable that everybody was available and we could get them and that they worked so well. And, and as you probably know, almost none of the main actors in this worked together. Nobody worked in the room at the same time. So you were recorded one week and you might have been recorded a month later and it was really just getting everybody in. It always astounds me how well it works when we finally put them all together and blows. And I think it worked beautifully. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Um, it's very odd for a voice director to say this, but some of my favorite moments in this film are the ones that have absolutely no dialogue. There's the moment when Superman and Kara see each other, and Kara said, I can't do it. I cannot. I, I can't fight Brady again. I can't. And Superman goes off and fights, and then suddenly she so shows up and helps to save the day, and they just share this moment where they don't speak. They just look at each other. And then the scene goes on. It's so beautiful. They don't say anything. They're like, oh my God, you can help me. And then they, just, they just say nothing. They just look at each other and then they, she accepts, like, okay, I'm on board. We'll do this together. I, I was backstage and heard their reaction to what might have been their favorite moment. And it, it shows up in the rating <laughs> now. Uh, got PG-13 for a gesture. Yeah. <laughs> the writer never wrote it in. Bob never put it in. Gesture is the option. A of rude gestures. <laughs> It was perfect. Oh boy. It was perfect. Hey, Matt, you, you, were you aware of the number of, I mean, the, the Tim Daly and uh, Mark Valley and Kyle McLaughlin and all the, all the different people who've done Superman before, and did that have any impact, or did you go in a different direction purposely? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're a fan of the character, inherently, you're aware of everybody who's done it, both in voice work and live action. And, that's in the back of your head, and the only thing you can really focus on is what the version of the character is for that particular story. And so um, I try to keep all that in the back of my head and, and work on the story that we um, that, that were working on in this film. I'll go to both actors. 
Um, I know actors have a tendency to not want to watch themselves on film uh, because they're always questioning your choices or being critical of what we adore. Um, are you able to watch the animated version and uh, and not do that, or to completely enjoy it like we do? No, it's still there. <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody out there want to ask a question? Uh -oh. oh, there's a line out the door. Okay. All right, so here's your objective. State your name. Make it a question. They know that they love that you love them, so we're there. Don't ask for kisses. Nobody's getting one except me. And, uh, and uh, put your question out there, and we'll, uh, we'll mark it down for potential prize. When Ben was saying, a question starts with a Y or an H and a W. Right. Uh, See, we said we can't. Hey, you know what? Um, hold on one second. Is there somebody technically that can work with that microphone because we can't hear anything he's saying? It sounds like he's underwater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which could be an interesting role because we're working on Aquaman next, right? <laughs> That's much better. Great. Now, say your name and don't start with the compliments. Tell us the question. There's lots of people in mind. Right. Umberto, um, I spoke to John Noble about two months ago and I asked him, how did you run into Andrew Romano? And he said, you're going to work, I'm going to work with you. How do you have the ear or the eyes to know I want him or I want her to work on the animated movie for me? You mean John specifically or any movie? Yeah, well, John, but any other actor, we got Matt and we got Molly here. How do you have the ear and the eyes say, him, her, you know? Well, you know, I, I always keep a wish list of actors that I want to work with, and then well, I'll get a project and, and read the project and then look at that wish list and see if any of those people fit into any of those characters. And John Noble specifically, I had met at Comic-Con in San Diego like two or three years ago at a Warner Brothers party and was such a huge fan. And when I introduced myself, I said, would you ever want to come and work on one of these? And he said, oh, sure, it would be my pleasure. And so I was just looking for something for him specifically at Brainiac scene. The perfect choice. Matt, we had talked about for many different projects. I just couldn't work the schedule out. And then when this came along, as a matter of fact, was it even before we offered you this that we talked about Thundercats? Because I was making Thundercats. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about this. This experience is so surreal for me, I can't even process what you had. I don't know. Thundercats, unfortunately, did not get picked up, and I couldn't get ahead on that. But Molly and I had worked together on Ben 10, and, uh, and, I knew when, and I knew when this came along and that we needed a young Supergirl voice, she was absolutely my first choice. But I know we can do this, and everybody said, okay, let's get her. And she was available and she work, and she's so beautiful. That's such a beautiful job. <laughs> I don't, I can't really say that I can remember exactly why. I just, I admire his acting so much yeah, that I just thought this, this role requires such a sensitive touch. And I, I knew he was a sensitive actor that way, that there was the maturity in his voice that we needed. It couldn't be a young voice. I'd have some age to it. And I just, you know, I never really know. I, I get these ideas and I go, wouldn't they be great? And they just walk keep going, 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 Next, Sheriff. Uh, my name is uh, William Fitz slash Rick Grimes, and my question is to up to anyone this may concern to in the panel is, what part in the comic book was hard to adapt to into the film that you wanted it to be, but just couldn't because of the difficulty of adaption towards transition movie? That. <laughs> well, most people refer to the visual style and wonder why we changed it. And I look at it this way. If you're going to do a likeness of Chris Reeves, you better have Chris Reeves do the voice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have Chris Reeves. I had Matt Bowman. And he was awesome. Just call and Bowman. Why not, you know? So I think, you know, why, why, would I, why would I draw a 
caricature of Superman to look like Chris Reeves when I have my phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Christopher Satchel. Uh, to the whole panel, uh, what was the most difficult feat you all had to accomplish um, in making this film? to Anaheim in traffic again. <laughs> 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 not having too much fun. <laughs> we have a really finite amount of time to get this done in, and that's always a challenge. The crunch that is getting this done in this small window. And the pre-production, when we initially record, we have a little bit more flexibility. Post-production, when we do the ADR, which is matching the picture, we have a tiny window of time. And with actors that work on series, 10, 12, 14, 18 hours a day, trying to find some time. Did we initially record on Saturday? I think we did. We even recorded the initial one. Yeah. Oh, right, right. <laughs> For me, scheduling is like the biggest nightmare, too. Yeah. 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 For, I, I just remember looking at the script, the, the, the toughest thing I like had to figure out was after after 75 years and the thousands of writers before me have written Superman, yeah, like one of Alan Burnett's first things that he asked me to do is, you know, come up with something new to do with Clark and Lois. How do you come up with something new to do with Clark and Lois? <laughs> That was that was a big challenge. That was a big nightmare. And uh, it, you know, given your guys' reaction when he pulls out the ring at the end, and I, I think I guess it worked out. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so grateful to have Andre and change because I was learning on the fly. Really, just You'd never know. The guys, and, uh, you know, guiding me, and learning to save my voice after I screamed for <laughs> six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Hi, my uh, name is Carlos, and my question is for the writer. Uh, what caused you to change the ending from the novel to the adaptation? <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear it. Sorry, Star of the... Ask it again, I'm sorry. Sorry, the star was standing behind you, and you were all being distracted. Okay, um, the name the, the change, uh, uh, it varies in their marketing causes and uh, clearances and the like, so sometimes we do have to alter the name a little slightly for uh, to accommodate those needs. Like, oh, is that what about the title? Yes. 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 Sorry. We went through like four or five during production. We were tired. Was it based on Superman Brainiac? Right. Superman Brainiac was the name of the, the book series by Jeff Johns. Um, no, we called it... My, my, okay. Oh. The um, uh, I went through a bunch of different titles while writing it. I think the one that I eventually ended up delivering it as was Superman, the Lost City of Krypton, the Lost City of Kandor, I think we called it at one point. Oh, it's your phone. You don't have to try to find Superman. No, no. Superman gets hitched. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> that wasn't my question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I asked uh, what made you change the ending from the book to the adaptation. That was the, like, from the ending was completely different. What do you mean? The, so the, the ending in the book... What book? The, you know, the, the, I honestly, it's, I wrote this four years ago, and, and so I honestly don't remember the specific details of, of what I changed, and you know, but the best answer I can give you is that I, I did work for the movie. There are some things where I'm asked to do things specifically, like I think in this particular case, there was an uncertainty as to, as to whether they were going to follow this up with the new Krypton, the, the, new, the new Krypton story in the books, and there was a request to leave it, that this could stand alone, or it could be ambiguous at the end. It, it, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, hands in that, and instructions that I'm given, and story needs. Um, so I, I can't go with a more specific answer about why I made certain choices, but they, you know, they all had a reason. All right, thank you, Carlos. We answered two questions. In one, Starro, Starro, Will, what do you know? How you doing, folks? <laughs> this man works for the government. I'm not joking. All right. <laughs> So, a couple of uh, Saturdays ago, I got kicked in the fields when you took off my Young Justice and Green Lantern. Um, is, there, is, uh, is, there, is there any way that you could get like a proper curtain call, like a direct-to-DVD movie, just wrap it up like a, a true final episode for both those series? Well, anything is possible, number one. <laughs> 
Good answer. What were you expecting? <laughs> really? Uh, and number two, um, yeah, we'll, we'll echo those thoughts back. Well, uh, uh, um, obviously we make the films, they make the series, and hopefully we can intersect the two someday. <laughs> That mic's a little high for you, isn't it? Go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, my name's Maria, um, and my question was for Matt. Um, what is it like about um, Clark and Lois's relationship? <laughs> what I liked in this particular story is, it was, you know, I found Superman quite mature in the story in general. Um, it sort of was like the battle of the control freaks. <laughs> because he's very protective of her in this particular story. Um, and he wants, he, he fears for her future, given if their relationship ever goes public. So um, I just thought it was fun to get to play and, and uh, get to be a little bit more charming with her while he was going through some some other, uh, you know, developments of issues with Brainiac and, and also kind of being parental towards Supergirl. Good. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bob, and I want to know, will we see Superman Red Sun as an animated movie? <laughs> well, then it's possible. Uh, you know what? We will, we will log that one down, right, James? We will log that one down under things we might consider in the future? It's definitely on my wish list, so. Hi, my name is Eric, and my question is, um, how did you, um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, how to, um, I'm sorry, how did you guys uh, come up with the way that you projected Lois so that she wasn't so much uh, B-word as she normally is? Oh. <laughs> Guess it's more for the writers. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, I would, I would differ with your Assessment. idea of how she usually is. Um, I, I, I think Lois is like, you know, one of the best characters ever, ever. Of any <laughs> franchise. She's, she's one of my favorite characters for right period, and, and I, I think she's, you know, the strongest character in this movie. She's like the one who knows herself the best and knows what she wants. And you made Molly gasp. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> that was about the girl. That was, that, was, that was about you. That was about the characters. Um, I, I, <laughs> the whole cast was incredible. So back to Lois. I'm not even sure like where, where to go. The, the, the answer, the answer I, I didn't have to like figure out how to not make her something. I, I wrote to you know my belief about that character and how I hear her and, and um, you know what, what what I was taught about Lois working with Alan and Paul and Bruce all those years ago. It just you know, that's that's what came up. We also hired a really talented actor. <laughs> We have time for about maybe one or two more questions. And let's take one or two more questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abby, and I was wondering, Matt and Molly, are Supergirl and Superman actually your favorite superheroes? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I love Supergirl. She, yeah. she was never the one that I pretended to be as a child. I was... I did it more towards boys and I did yeah. but uh, <laughs> I, I, I like being mad, um, but I have to say, it was such a treat really discovering this new heroine. I never thought of myself that way, and I was so happy that you gave me the opportunity to become Supergirl. I hope we played her well, and I enjoy playing her. And now I think uh, Poison Ivy might have a run for our money. <laughs> 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 I'm 
growing up, I was always the sidekick or the lesser of whatever my brother was. So if he was uh, Superman, I was Superboy, or if he was Batman, I was Robin. <laughs> but my mom made me a Superman cape one year, and I wore it out for like two years. <laughs> So I guess I manifested Superman Unbound unconsciously when I was, you know, four or five years old. Uh, yeah, so I would say he probably is. Um, I also like Nightwing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Steve. This question is for Andrea. Over the years, you've made some really good, inspired choices in casting. This is a great cast here. But I know sometimes people volunteer to do voices. And I know on a number of occasions, Mark Hamill has volunteered to do the voice of the Joker if you do The Killing Joke. Would you ever consider taking him and Kevin off for that? Yeah. You know, any project that comes my way that has Batman in it, I always, the first question I ask is, can I use Kevin Conroy on this? And, and the decision is not made by me. I, I get my directives from DC Comics and Warner Animation and Warner Home Video. And so, I mean, whether it's Mark Hamill or, or Kevin Conroy, when I prep a script, it's their voices I hear in my head. But, but that's not always the way we want to go for whatever reason. We don't always want to repeat ourselves. We want to do something different. We're going to use a different style of art. We're going to give them a different age. We want to do some, a few things different. So whether that piece ever gets made or not, it's mentioned every year, Killing Joke. I, I have no idea what the various powers that people will tell me that they want for it. But I certainly would consider it. I'm guessing this is the last question. Hi, uh, really quickly, uh, congratulations to uh, James Tucker for filling in for Bruce Tim. And then second, how do you know what elements do you um, take from the comic book and then put it in the movie, so how do you know what to change? And uh, finally, can I have one of those posters from my classrooms for my students that love Superman? Oh my god. <laughs> You know, I'm just going at this job from the heart. I love DC Comics, I always have, ever since I was a little kid, and I just want to bring them to you like you're used to seeing them. And if we can open up the range of, of characters, so much the better. Maurice, do we have time for one more? Or, uh, that's it, then why not? <laughs> we have somebody coming up from out of nowhere. Of course. <laughs> they will all come. Are you serious? Okay, oh, quick you question. How you when, <laughs> when did the Riddler get his time in the spotlight? <laughs> <laughs> When does the Riddler get his time in the spotlight? We, we, I guarantee you'll see the Riddler before 2015. Ah. Woo! Woo! Any character in the DC Universe, the Riddler is the hardest one to write stories for. Wow. They are the toughest stories to write. And it'd be great to do it. <laughs> Sounds like there's a different word. I'd say it was a big role, but you know, it's good, and it's somebody that we love, so it's, uh, it's we're going to have fun with that. All right, uh, that's it. We all, that's all we have time for, correct, Maurice? All right. Woo! Thank you for coming.
special guest from Superman and Bound, our cast, aka the team, and our special guest monthly, Mr. Gary Mariano.